Welcome back to 5 ways to improve storytelling in video games. This little pet project of mine will be an ongoing series. I'm aiming to distill everything we've discussed so far into actionable feedback for both small indie and major AAA developers. Because most of the concepts discussed here are just repurposed screenwriting rules and guidelines. But instead of a focus on show don't tell for a visual medium, it's play don't show for an interactive medium. Before we do a quick recap of the first 5 ways, I just want to state what I consider to be good video game storytelling. And I think the best way to do that is by listing a few games I think have good to great storytelling. Now these are not ranked by quality, I'm just listing them as they come to my mind. Games like the entire Half-Life franchise, the entire Deus Ex franchise, Bioshock 1 and 2, Sekiro, Bloodborne and all of the God of War games. Yes, I think they're all good, just with a different narrative focus. Firewatch, Inside, Brothers, Soma, Spec Ops The Line, Mass Effect 1 through 3, yeah we're ignoring the ending here, the recent Tomb Raider games, all the Arkham games before Rocksteady sold their soul, Witcher 2 and 3 before CD Projekt Red sold their soul. I think there is a theme here, Marvel, Spider-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy, Dead Space 1 and 2 and Alien Isolation, both Prey and Stray. Also included are Star Wars games like Jedi Academy, Republic Commando and Fallen Order. And finally, The Last of Us Part 1. I don't know why they added the part 1, they never made a sequel. Now this list is in no way complete because I know some of you are already about to yell at me in the comments. Feel free to share your favorite games with the best narrative in the comments. The common through line here is that these games do not compromise gameplay for the story. Granted, they succeed at varying degrees, but what matters is that they do. Now what do I mean by that? In a perfect scenario, you're telling the story through gameplay. The opposite is simply bad video game storytelling, like the Senua games. I'll do a separate video just on these two because I think they're doing everything a video game should not do, delivering some of the worst storytelling I've seen on par with student films. And I've made plenty of student films, I know it when I see it. This one just happens to have a massive budget. By contrast, Sekiro and Guardians of the Galaxy are two of my favorite games when it comes to how the narrative and gameplay are woven together. Now that you know what I personally consider to be good video game storytelling, let's quickly recap part 1 of this series. Also for a detailed breakdown you should just watch part 1. Number 1. Have a narrative. By this I mean have an actual script or screenplay ready before you start developing your game. Most video game devs start with the gameplay loop and then writers are tasked to construct a narrative on top. This is not a good way to tell stories. To be fair, I think this is changing as more and more developers commission a script early in the development. Number 2. Add a character spine. This is what makes a character three dimensional. It's a character's external want and an internal need. It's one of the first things you learn in screenwriting and it's the main reason why for example Joel from The Last of Us is a proper three dimensional character. Number 3. Have a midpoint. Midpoints must do three things. Be in the middle, raise the stakes and hold the key towards the hero's transformation. Be it a simple conversation with an oracle or finding the location of your next target, it all brings about change. Number 4 and 5 are connected. Drop Ludo Narrative Dissonance and use Play Don't Show instead. Ludo Narrative Dissonance describes the disconnect between the story told through gameplay and the story told through non-interactive elements like cutscenes. In my opinion this is an utterly useless idea and developers have come out to outright state they are ignoring Ludo Narrative Dissonance. The reason why I think it's useless is twofold. A. It's for the most part just a byproduct of number one. The dissonance exists because you added the story on top of the gameplay loop instead of weaving the two together from the get-go by using Play Don't Show and B. It incentivizes horrible solutions to reduce the dissonance which for the most part consists of taking control away from the player. The Senua games are a prime example of this. Also some of the best video game stories ever told use high levels of dissonance, games like Spec Ops The Line or Bioshock. Or you can simply utilize play on show so that barely any players will register any dissonance left because you're telling your story with the gameplay. These five are basically the foundation on which I'm going to build this entire series. With the recap out of the way, we can start with part 2. Number 1. What character? There are only two types of basic characters in storytelling and that's the two and three dimensional character. You have to decide which one is a better fit for your gameplay loop. My Doom and Halo videos have a more detailed breakdown on this, but long story short, the three dimensional character goes through an internal change, the two dimensional character does not. 
Instead, the two-dimensional character changes the characters around them. In storytelling, everything starts and comes back to character. You have to understand your character to properly build the story structure. And the only difference with video games is that you have to bring a third element into this harmony. Gameplay. Only when character, structure and gameplay coexist in harmony can you utilize play don't show with maximum efficiency. Which gets us to number 2. What midpoint? Your midpoints will be vastly different depending on your chosen character type. So for us to bring this all down to a practical level, let's take a look at two really well done examples. Joel in The Last of Us and the Master Chief in Halo Combat Evolved. What is Joel's midpoint? Since Joel is a three-dimensional character, his midpoint is a key for transformation. Meaning, in roughly the middle of the story, a story bit happens that contains the very information that will help the three-dimensional character to change, to transform, and to overcome their flaw. What is Joel's flaw? His inability to connect with his role as a father. After he failed to save his own daughter, Joel spent 20 years adrift and cynical. So for him to transform and heal, he must, metaphorically, become a father again. Only then will he truly be alive. The midpoint reflects this back at Joel. Sam. Henry. Henry, stay there. Henry. What have you done? I'm gonna get that gun from me, okay? Oh, okay, okay, easy. This is your fault. This is nobody's fault, Henry. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! <laughs> It's here that Joel realizes he must become a father again for him and Ellie to survive. If he fails as a father, both of them are dead. And this all builds up properly towards the ending. Any sensible, healthy and strong father would exactly do the same thing Joel does in the end. Protect your child at all costs. The game's showdown is a culmination of that character arc because Amy Hennig is a good writer and she knew what she was doing. <laughs> now imagine some hack writer coming in to tell us that these people are equally morally justified in a story about fatherhood. <laughs> ah, thank god that never happened. On the other hand, the Master Chief never changes, so we don't get the key for transformation. We get a key towards more awareness instead. Our perception of the story world changes. So what happens at Halo's midpoint? Yes, the Forerunner built this place, what they called a fortress world, in order to... No, that can't be. Oh, those Covenant fools. They must have known. There must have been signs. Slow down. You're losing me. The Covenant found something. Buried in this ring. Something horrible. And now, they're afraid. Something buried? Where? The Captain. We've got to stop the Captain. Keys? What the weapons we... cache he's looking for. It's not really... We can't let him get inside. I don't understand. There's no time. Get out of here. Find Keys. Stop him. Before it's too late! At exactly at the end of the fifth mission, Cortana discovers the truth about the Halo Ring. The stakes are also raised with the introduction of the Flood, and so the key towards more awareness leads to the only logical conclusion. The two-dimensional character comes from serialized television. Columbo, for example, is a classic two-dimensional character. He never changes. The reason he never changes is so that the audience can jump into any episode of a season at any time. Columbo is simply thrown into a new situation where he lacks awareness. In this case, the awareness of the truth. Who is the killer? This is why so many detective stories feature a two-dimensional character. The key towards awareness is perfect for a tug-of-war battle between the killer and the detective. Both are fighting over the audience's perception of reality. Who is the killer and how did they kill? Character and structure are inextricably linked and video games are no exception. Which gets us to number 3. What genre? By this I mean, what storytelling genre? Because there are two types of genres, marketing genres and storytelling genres. Marketing terms or genres like sci-fi, horror, action, thriller and so on do not tell us what a story is. Video game genres are even more confusing and I would argue also meaningless when discussing the storytelling. For example, way too many games with vastly different storytelling are classified as action adventures. For writers, storytelling genres are more important. What is the story? Now I'm not going to break all 10 of these down in this video. 
video. I will dedicate a video to each as time goes on and I've already done so for the full Triumphant. For this video what's important is to simply understand which narrative fits your story and gameplay loop best. Some story types are completely incompatible with gameplay. I would argue the full Triumphant is one of them. For a simple reason, no one wants to play a game where you are inept for a prolonged period of time. Even when games are based on a full archetype like Naruto, you actually never play the inept version of Naruto. On the upside, the biggest advantage games have is that you can mix and match everything we have discussed so far to create unique genre combinations. For example, Jedi Fallen Order is a classic Golden Fleece story, but in a classic Golden Fleece story, you require a three-dimensional character to reach a breaking point. To reveal their flaw, the reason they went on the Golden Fleece journey to begin with. The journey burns away the facade the protagonists constructed around themselves. That's why they go through a dark night of the soul, a clear breaking point. The problem for games is that the player never reaches a breaking point because the player keeps getting better at the game as they progress. Well, you can spike the difficulty like a Dark Souls game, but Fallen Order is not a Souls-like. So what did Fallen Order do instead? You see, if you can't burn the facade away because the player keeps getting better at the game, you simply invert the facade instead by combining elements of both the two and three dimensional character types. The facade is inverted with the flaw through more awareness, and the skill tree is the catalyst for this. All you do in Jedi Fallen Order is play through Cal's trauma. Each skill unlocked offers more awareness of Cal's trauma and flaw, and it all culminates into a proper Dark Knight of the Soul segment where Cal can't escape his trauma and he must confront his flaw. This is why you must use the framework of character plus structure plus gameplay to properly utilize play don't show. The other reason you should understand your storytelling type is that it allows you to craft your dramatic arc with more accuracy and efficiency. When my Halo video dropped, a few people argued Halo is a space opera, not its own thing as I insisted with the Paleo Cosmic Epic. Here's the problem with the marketing term space opera, and to the same extent military sci-fi. It doesn't tell you anything about character because you can take the character into any direction. Space opera can be golden fleece like Star Wars A New Hope. It can be out of the bottle like the fifth element or superhero like Flash Gordon. All three of these are space operas. Similar problems arise with terms like action adventure in video games. It simply doesn't tell you anything about character. And most writers would know what to do with the Master Chief if you told them Halo is a space opera. As demonstrated with two seasons of this nonsense. Number 4. What dramatic arc? All dramatic arcs are a tug of war battle between the protagonist's facade and flaw. You can use a 3 or 5x structure to burn away the facade or even a 4x structure known as Kishoten Ketsu to vanish the facade with a twist. Technically you can add as many acts as you want, you simply must stick to the one prerequisite of what constitutes an act. An act is a fractal of the greater whole. So if you use a free act structure, your acts too will have an inciting incident, a midpoint and a climax. Now this flexibility is very useful for a gameplay loop. For example, Halo orders its missions along a free act structure. Jedi Fallen Order uses a 5 act structure where each planet represents a separate act. Some Super Mario games construct their levels with Kisho Tenketsu. So the dramatic arc is literally built into the level design. Whichever one you pick, as long as it comes from a place of character, it's going to be alright. Because if you understand your character, you'll also understand what dramatic arc to use, which gets us to number 5. Use the pulp method. When I broke down Doom 2016, I used Pulp Fiction as a starting point on how to improve video game storytelling. Because Pulp Fiction didn't break the mold, it simply rearranged the mold to form a master shape. Pulp Fiction tells a story of death and rebirth by forming a linear 5-act structure with 5 non-chronological 3-act structured acts. Yeah, it's a mouthful. You can watch the Doom video for a detailed breakdown, but in essence what the pulp method means is that you can tell a complete dramatic arc with gameplay by utilizing a master shape. Case in point, Stray. Stray tells a story of death and rebirth with a cat, and it's not even a talking cat. No dialogue is needed, and only a minimal amount of cutscenes. The gameplay does most of the heavy lifting, because all levels are placed to form a dramatic arc with 5 acts. Each level takes you through the main beat of its respective act. I'm going to do a video solely dedicated to Stray with a more detailed breakdown. But to give you a quick insight into what I mean, for example the prison level is clearly the dark night of the soul of the entire journey. 
it comes with an appropriate all is lost beat and an act break that takes us into the next act with newfound confidence. And it's placed appropriately on the tail end of a 5 act structure. By the way, Elum in Fallen Order serves the very same purpose. It's here that Cal finally overcomes his trauma. That's the beauty of the pulp method. Remember, the goal is to reduce the use of cutscenes as much as possible without compromising the gameplay. And these are the 5 ways to improve storytelling in video games. As I've said before on this channel, I think video games are still just in their infancy when it comes to storytelling. As the medium evolves, it's just a matter of developing the appropriate storytelling tools. I come from the world of screenwriting and filmmaking. When I direct a project, I create something called the director's book. It's a breakdown of every scene and character, the themes, point of view and purpose. Once that is done, my entire shot list will depend on it. Each shot is evaluated on the basis of storytelling. Does it tell the story it needs to tell and will the audience understand it? This decision making process influences everything. Composition, camera placement and movement, the blocking and the lighting. Actually, every conversation I have with my director of photography. This is what you do with a visual medium. The same process needs to happen for an interactive medium with gameplay. Now, even if you think this is all nonsense and the story just gets in the way of gameplay, all of the elements discussed here can be built into a gameplay loop with no story. But it would still give you the feeling of playing through a dramatic arc. The biggest problem storytelling in games has is the feeling of inferiority. That's why the dreaded word cinematic is used all the time. Cinematic shouldn't be a focus in video games, it's a word related to cinema to cinematic output. You're not creating something to be seen in the cinema, you're creating something to be played. Hence why you play don't show. So let me know in the comments what you think of this breakdown so far. More videos are on the way and I'll have some really good news to share hopefully sooner than later. In any case, I'll see you on the next page of storytelling.